Well, welcome. Uh, welcome to Tugboat Institute uh, Summit 2022. I'm with Tom Peters. Tom is one of my heroes. Uh, Tom had a tremendous impact on my life. In fact, on this bookshelf here, I've got this book, a little torn up, pages are just a bit yellow, but this was in my backpack in the early 1980s, and this actually changed my life. Uh, the, the, the ideas, the theories, um, it was an interesting time, and Tom will talk about this a little more later, about what was happening in America that led to the importance of this book, but um, it just feels like a real gift. So, Tom, thank you for being here with me, and I'm very thank excited. You. Tell us a little bit about it. Uh, about your early life, Tom, just what was it like growing up in your, your household and kind of maybe bring us up to the time of McKinsey? Well, I'll try to do it without taking our entire time together. Uh, I was born in Annapolis, Maryland, about five miles north of the Naval Academy. Uh, that was not constantly on our mind, but it was a big deal. My parents were of modest means. Uh, I went to local elementary school. We had a crappy high school. So I went to a small prep school that had been a prep school for the Naval Academy. Uh, and we didn't have any money. So my mom had to start teaching the fifth grade to make that happen, which I appreciated. So time passes. I did well at school. Well, at any rate, the uh, half of my friends went to the Naval Academy and I went off to Cornell Engineering uh, without a big bank account and got into the Navy ROTC, and there is something called regular ROTC, and that means basically the Navy paid my entire tuition at Cornell for four years. So, so Tom, you ended up, uh, after the war, I, I don't know, after serving, I guess you were in the Pentagon and then Stanford, is that correct? Yeah. So I might, I might skip a little bit here just to get to McKinsey, um, but what... Um, I guess you were asked to figure something out at McKinsey, correct? Uh, I had just gotten a PhD from Stanford in organizational effectiveness. I was called in, not exactly sure how my name made it to the top of the list. I was in San Francisco, McKinsey San Francisco office. I was told to go to New York and talk to the managing director, you know, God, in other words. And he said, which is not far from what you were saying, he said, we design all these incredibly sophisticated, brilliant strategies for our clients, and then they can't implement, or they fall down implementing. And he said, I remember he said it kind of half laughingly, he said, you just got this PhD in Stanford from how organizations work, figure out what the hell the problem is. And, uh, you know, that began the march that led to that book that sat behind you on your, you know, on your, on your shelf. I, I want one other tiny story about that. Uh, we, I did research, my colleague, Bob Waterman, who has just passed away, did research. Uh, we were coming along both in the San Francisco office and the managing director of the office called me in one, I don't know, call it a Wednesday. Uh, he called me in and he said, and you know, these are olden days. This is like 1980. So computers ain't what they were today. Uh, he said, all our computers have crashed. We can't get the presentation printed. We were going to LA. We were in San Francisco to speak to Dart Industries. He said, you've been doing that. You've been doing that organizational effectiveness crap. Could you grab some paper and come down with me and give a speech? Uh, so, you know, the answer was yes, because he was the managing director. So that night, by sheer coincidence, my ex-wife and I, who had season tickets to the San Francisco Ballet, went to see a ballet performance. And it was awesome. You know, the arts at their best. And I don't think what I'm about to tell you is BS, because it literally did happen. So, you know, I've got to give the go go off to give the speech the next morning, get back to the ballet. It's 10 o'clock at night. I'm sitting down to work on the presentation. And somewhere along the way, Dave, uh, some little bell went off in my mind. And I thought, what is a balletic performance? 
It is a bunch of our fellow human beings attempting to do something of value. What is a business? The same thing. We routinely, if it is deserved, use the word excellence in a balletic performance, a symphonic performance, uh, and so on. And I never heard the word excellence used associated with business. And so, you know, I'm putting the presentation together and it had a cover page, eight and a half by 11. It was a paper presentation, paper presentation in my slides. And on the front in one word, I wrote the word excellence. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's where it came from. Obviously there were 80,317,000 twists and turns, but that's where it popped up. And it's what I still feel today. That's awesome. That's awesome. So, um, so Tom, you, in this kind of winding path that led to the In Search of Excellence, besides kind of the kind of honing on this concept of excellence in business, I recall you saying something about you, gave, you went to Siemens, I believe, and gave a monster presentation, 700 slides or something like that. And then you were invited to PepsiCo and they said, look, let's cut that down to about 1%. And I do believe you said this was your best work, which I believe in, ends up being kind of laying the groundwork for this book. But what, what was happening there between your 700? Well, I'd say two things without boring you to death. The uh, <laughs> Siemens presentation must have been pretty good. They funded the rest of the project. Right. Um, so I'm going to speak to PepsiCo. And I know there is a slight difference between a sophisticated engineering company and some folks who make. Frito-Lay and Pepsi. Uh, so I, I didn't dumb it down. I simplified it. And I simplified it. And I ended up again with this one page with eight attributes coming out of, of our research. And you, you give me too much credit. That was a page. But the presentation went on a while. Mm. And I finished the presentation. And the chairman looked at me and he said, I like that page back there, but what about all that other crap? You didn't need it. So, you know, I had, I had a little incentive. I think Don Kendall was his name. He's a Pepsi, all right. Pepsi uh, chairman at the time. And so that then what happened was through a coincidence on top of a coincidence on top of a coincidence, coincidence the editor of Business Week saw something and he said, write a little article for us. And that was really the breakthrough moment because I took those, that simple list of eight attributes and turned it into a Business Week article. Apparently it was the first article they'd ever had by an outsider. Uh, turned it into a Business Week article, uh, was received well. And there was a women in business woman and I believe it was Cincinnati who saw it and liked it. And about a month later, when I opened the mail, remember the mailboxes, these paper things with envelopes, slid them. Uh, I opened the mail and there was a book contract from Harper and Row. Wow. And, you know, I was, you know, I've always been a reader, but holy shit, write a book. I'm an engineer. Engineers can't write books. They can barely spell their name for God's sakes. Well, hey, Tom, I want to jump into the, those eight principles. I think, uh, you know, we've kind of set the context for it. Uh, just set it a little bit further from, I think, a macro standpoint. You know, this was 1982 when it was published. Um, inflation was at 10%. Uh, the prime interest rate was something like 18, 20%. Unemployment was above 10%. And there was a real fear that Jap Japan was eating our lunch, you know, and um, you know, some of those elements, I think, are starting to rise again that could take us in that direction. Hopefully not that severe. But it was a, it was a real time in which people needed to be inspired. And that's why I think your message was so well received. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's the every good product, I believe, has the same thing in common. Pretty good product, perfect timing. Yeah. I mean, the book was literally released the week that President Reagan announced 10 percent unemployment. Uh, you were a little bit low because when I became a McKinsey partner, I needed to borrow money to buy the shares. And I got a prime plus one deal from Toronto Dominion, which cost me 26%. Oh my gosh. Yeah. But I think, I think it was mainly psychology. Um, and the psychology was, you know, coming out of World War II, we were the kings of the hill. 
uh, in general, economically, the Japanese obviously had been defeated. We were kings of the hill, and I wish I could use inappropriate language, uh, which I'm not going to stoop to, but our cars stood for our masculinity. You know, right. your hot Chevy, you know, that was when they had the tail fins on them, and that was America, was your hot car, especially for, for the boys. Uh, and then suddenly, there are all these damn Toyotas and Nissans and Hondas that are all over the road. Didn't cost all that much. Uh, we had always worried about the sexy tail fins and not whether the damn thing started when you turned the key uh, and their stuff started. Hey, Tom, one thing you had said to me when we talked about this is that in its essence, there were firms that gave a damn, took great care of their people and made excellence their standard, outperforming the rest over the mid and long haul is kind of what I took away from an earlier conversation. And a lot of it was about the people, but let's let's go into the eight, okay? Can I can I walk us well, through that? No, I'm going to go back to what you just said. Oh, okay, right. Because I can retire now because your one sentence completely summarized everything I've done for the last 40 years. <laughs> so the first was a bias for action, active decision-making. Yeah, there was, I don't know whether this term exists, but... Way back when, in my consulting days, there was something that we called analysis paralysis. Yeah. Probably does still exist, actually. And it was, you know, you make the presentations and you do this and you push paper and you never get around to, you know, doing your thing. The bias, the bias for action, the bias. There was a magic half hour in the writing of In Search of Excellence. And it's when Bob Waterman and I went from San Francisco, 30 miles down the road to Palo Alto to have a meeting with John Young, who was the president of Hewlett Packard, a much more agile, we won't get into that, Hewlett Packard than it is today. And along the way, he introduced us to what he called the HP way. And in that HP way, and this no bullshit changed my life, was MBWA or managing by wandering around. And it was at that point, relative to the action stuff and so on, that I realized that leadership was an intimate act. It was, you know, it was, and, and John took us on a walk through the engineering spaces. And for God's sakes, it was a billion dollar company at that point. Nobody was freaked out by the fact that he was there. Um, and he had discussions about what was going on with, you know, 26 year old engineers who had just been hired. and. By the way, contrast that. And since you've invited me, I assume that you sort of vaguely believe that what I say is my best effort to be truthful. <laughs> um, I did a PBS show on a woman who ran a parts plant in uh, Michigan for GM. Her name was Pat Carrigan. And the what I remember, one thing I remember is we went camera on, we went and, you, and, and interviewed the head of the UAW in the plant. And in the big facility, the union leaders got an office and so on. And so, you know, I go in, we sit down, we start talking, we start talking about Pat. And he said, Tom, let me tell you why I respect Pat. He said, she got here and no more than a half an hour later, I got a phone call, not from an assistant, but from her. And the, the Pat said, I'd like to come down to your office and have a chat. He said, I've been in this plant for 25 years. No plant manager has ever been visited my office. I have always been invited to go to the plant manager's office. And, you know, to me, it's, you know, this is my life. Those variables are the essence of getting things done, doing good work, doing work you're proud of, and so on. And so that's the bias for action. Go, go to where the action is. So we did bias for action. So the second is close to the customer. Uh, close to the customer is intimate relationships with your customers. I remember one time I was talking to a Xerox guy and he said, I never pay any attention to the incentive programs because my life is the quality of the relationships I have with the people I sell to. And when the top of the company comes, comes up with some bullshit incentive, I'm not going to shove it down the throat of my 
customer. And it's, you know, literally he, he was family, if you will, with, with all of his customers. So regardless of the size, and Xerox was a big but getting bigger company at the time, and all of this is regardless of size. Obviously, it's easier to do it in a 30-person firm than a 3,000-person firm, but it can be done at any scale. All right. Autonomy and entrepreneurship. Uh, what we meant like that, and we learned more of this from 3M than anybody else, is that your organization should be peppered with entrepreneurs and some in, not insignificant handful of them should be working on projects probably out of the office. I mean, now it means all different in times of pandemic and so on, but away from the corporate headquarters. And we, we learned along the way this term called skunk works, which became so important to me. And the Skunk Works idea came from Lockheed. Uh, and in order to develop a big military plane, I bet the numbers are the same as about seven or eight years, three or 4,000 people. Well, there's this guy by the name of Kelly Johnson who did a spy plane. I think it was the U-2 actually, uh, developed the spy plane. He got the hell off of the Lockheed campus he did the spy plane with 125 people in something like 18 months, you know, minus the corporate bullshit. So it's you want your place to be peppered with with entrepreneurs focusing on projects, breaking every rule in the game. Mm, great. Productivity through people. Uh, I'd make it number one if I was rewriting the book because I have rewritten written the book 20 times and the people thing comes first. And I just don't understand why people don't get that. I mean, I, I said, Dave, one time that, you know, I've got all these degrees in engineering and business, but if you want to understand my books, you must show me a signed written certificate that proves that you graduated from the third grade. Because literally there is no fourth year calculus or two years reading Milton and Shakespeare required for this stuff. You know, be decent, be thoughtful, help people grow. For God's sakes, what's so bloody difficult about that? It is difficult if you've gone to the Stanford or Harvard Business School and, you know, that, was, that wasn't exactly on the agenda. But don't get me going on business schools. Okay. That would be bad. <laughs> uh, Hands-on, value-driven. Well, I guess that's, that's my MBWA, basically. Okay. But the value-driven part of it, which we'll also come back to, is uh, an organization that literally has a set of holy values and it lives up to them every day. Companies like in those days when we did the research, Johnson & Johnson, Johnson & Johnson, and only the old people among our watchers will remember this. Johnson & Johnson, somebody died of Tylenol. Johnson & Johnson in 27 seconds took every bottle of, of <laughs> Tylenol off of every shelf in the world. And it was because this wasn't their exact words. It was do no harm was their, you know, was their motto. And they didn't, they didn't think they just got the damn stuff off of there. So it's, it's values like that that are, again, the key always really lived. It's a good story. That's a really good example of that. How about stick to your knitting? Well, that's one that's fascinating to people. And we had a lot of research that we pulled together. And I think things have only gotten worse. Stick to the knitting doesn't mean make the same product for the rest of your life. What it does mean is work on stuff that you have a pretty good understanding of. Uh, you know, keep it within your intellectual pile. At the time we wrote the book, these big, giant, sexy conglomerates like ITT were the talk of the town. And, you know, they'd buy 87 companies and then their performance would crack down. Great. Um, next one, simple form lean staff. Uh, get the bureaucrats the hell out of the way. Gotcha. It's just about as simple as that. A friend of mine by the name of Bob Stone was the 
number two guy in logistics at the Department of Defense and it, responsible for bases. Uh, and the, one of the first things he did when he came in is he found the guidance manual for bases in the entire Department of Defense. It was 354 pages long. This is about a, two days after he got there. He called, his, called somebody in, his deputy, I think, and he said, here's what you're going to give me. He said, you are going to be back to me in 10 days or less with a three-page manual. I mean, holy shit. Uh, and he pulled it off, but it, you know, it, it really means to the extent that you can minimize, you can minimize the corporate bullshit. It is possible. That's great. And then last one is simultaneous loose type properties. The idea there uh, was basically uh, entrepreneurial as hell, but with a set of core values that are relied upon as much as anything in the Bible or the Quran or, or what have you. Values, but other than that, go for it. So let's do this because I know we're a little tight on time, but I want to throw out a bunch of ideas that we've talked about in the last couple of conversations that are beyond the book. And again, just to get a reaction from you on those, you say in your book, Excellence Now, you call obsession with listening leader skill number one and core value number core value number one. Why? At the first, my first response is you don't learn jack shit when you're talking. Okay. Uh, Stop there, Tom. There, there is, but that's great. Yeah. Let's, do, let's do the next one. There, there is, there is you literally. You pounded your proverbial fist exclaiming companies do an unbelievable shitty job of promoting and training people in first line management. You know, this moment, yeah. the white paper we did this conversation. What do you yeah, want to say about absolutely. that? Um, as I said earlier, I was in the Navy. The chief petty officers run the Navy, the sergeants run the Army and the Marine Corps and the Air Force. Uh, you are, I believe, I wrote this, I believe that the full collection of first line bosses is the number one corporate asset. And it's not a fairy tale because you can find the research that says first line bosses drive all the outcomes. They drive the productivity, they drive the quality, they drive the, you know, the Boy, leaving rate right from the organization. Yep. And, and we, just, it's, we just don't take them seriously enough by which I mean, you know, as I like to say, any idiot can be a vice president, but to be a good first line supervisor with a group of 17 people, that's the deal. Yeah, that's awesome, Tom. Okay, next popcorn. You said to me, Susan Cain's book caused my jaw to drop and later said it's the best business book of the century, which I will caveat with the exception of yours and your other 19. Unfortunately, you're talking to an old man. That was the last century. <laughs> you're right. Fair enough. So why? Why, why did your jaw drop in that after reading Well, that? you almost got it right. The words I used was Susan Cain called me a jerk. Mm. And, and in it, I said, I think I wrote, Susan Cain called me an idiot. <laughs> uh, she said, one of the most lovely people I've ever met, and that's complete nonsense. We undervalue and disrespect introverts. And Susan was trained as a lawyer. She doesn't use a comma unless it has been researched. Uh, you know, but basically... You know, one of her early lines is people go for people who talk more, who talk faster, who are quick on their feet. Uh, and, and yet the introverts, the quiet ones who are 40 or 50 percent of the population, uh, you know, the evidence is there. They're, you know, we just talked about listening a minute ago. Uh, the evidence is there. They're better leaders. They are demonstrably, measurably better leaders. And one of the reasons is they listen. You can't escape her because the research is good. And she's talking about undervaluing half of the population. Well, here, and that's why I put it on my <clears throat> ivory tower for its importance. A little side note, many of our evergreen CEOs and presidents are introverts. But let's talk about another underutilized group, in your opinion. You said it's such a mistake to have so few women in mid and large companies in executive roles. 
What are they missing by not having these women in these executive roles? Not much. Profit, growth, quality of product, just some shit like that. <laughs> in 1996, uh, the president of my training company, who was a woman, said, you're going to a meeting in Boston. We were in Palo Alto. Uh, and you're going to be spoken to by a bunch of women. And these were women who were really powerhouses. Uh, a woman called Judy George, who had started what was then a fast-growing fashion company called Domain Home Fashions. Of all things in the world, the woman who was the first woman driver in the Indy, Indy 500, for God's sakes. And they spent two hours, it's kind of like the Susan Cain thing, demonstrating to me the degree to which women were dismissed, pushed aside, and so on. Uh, you know, one of my best McKinsey pals and toughest guys wrote something and he said, our research search shows that if you want to grow your company, start by promoting more women. That's you know, it. the fact of the matter is, I wish I had the book at hand, it's somewhere five feet away. Women are better leaders, women are better negotiators. Look, I don't want to piss anybody off who's watching us. Again, back to the, to the math training. I am talking about a normal distribution. There are shitty women leaders and there are fabulous men leaders, but on average, on average, beyond the shadow of a doubt, women do a better job. The one I really love is there is they're better investors. The most wonderful book title ever came from a woman by the name of Lou Ann Lofton who works for The Motley Fool. And the title of the book is, oh my God, this is so great. Warren Buffett invests like a girl and why you should too. <laughs> and the lovely thing was that Buffett hadn't heard of the book. He looked at the book and he wrote the first Amazon review. And oh, he God. said in, the, in his review, basically, he said, I didn't know I invested like a girl until I read this thing, but she's right. Yeah. And, and Tom, in some ways, you know, another way to think about this is that Evergreens have this wonderful opportunity to have another source of competitive advantage by really enabling their introverts and the women in the working population. So take advantage of that. Use that as another source of competitive advantage against the folks who just can't see that. And my very last thing for you is, is that you talk about the power of thank you. You talk about a CEO who had written over 30,000 thank you notes through their career. And uh, you may want to comment on this, but I want to thank you, Tom. I want to thank you for the time today, for sharing this with our CEOs that are in the room with us today at the summit, as well as for being able to share this with the broader Evergreen movement, because this is really important stuff and it's your life's work. And we want to carry that forward for you in our organizations. Last words. And I ain't as young as I used to be. I will return the thank you because as I think you can see, it is a message which I would like to continue to get out and underscore with high volume and so on. So, you know, this is good for you and it's good for me. I live to communicate this message. Well, that's great. Well, Tom, thank you for the time together. I'm forever grateful. It's been a real treat. Thanks.